Planet America's fake news. What the hell is going on here? It's time to take off for Planet America. I'm John Barron. And I'm Chaz Lichadalo. This week, do Democrats have a smoking gun or can the White House slow the march to impeachment? The president's under fire from Republicans, but not as under fire as the Kurds are. I don't think the US is really doing anything really different in Syria than we were doing before this announcement. We'll also look at Elizabeth Warren's surge to the top of the polls. And the controversy that could take her back down again. In the History Department this week, the story of the first president to be impeached, Andrew Johnson. Speaking of impeachment, with so much happening, we'd better... Break it down. OK, here are some of the major developments of the past week. Text messages between American diplomats concerning Ukraine were released by the House Intelligence Committee following the appearance of former US envoy Kurt Volker. The messages continued until last month and they show a debate between the diplomats over whether President Trump was exerting improper pressure on Ukraine. The pressure points were almost $400 million in frozen US military aid and a proposed phone call between the Ukrainian and US president with the prospect of a White House visit to follow. The texts also reveal the central role that Rudy Giuliani played in setting preconditions for leader-to-leader -leader contact at a time when he was spearheading President Trump's efforts to undercover any Ukraine connection in 2016 or with the Bidens. Before we look at the actual texts, let's have a look at the tech stores. First, Kurt Volker, who served more than 20 years as a diplomat, worked on the Bosnia Accords in the 90s under President Clinton. He was ambassador to NATO under President George W. Bush. He's been the special representative to Ukraine since 2017, that is until his resignation last month. Gordon Sondland is the US ambassador to the European Union. His background is in business, a real estate owner and real estate investor. He was a major donor to the Trump campaign. He chipped in a million bucks for the Trump inauguration. As a reward, he was made ambassador last year. And Bill Taylor, like Volker, a career diplomat. He's worked for administrations of both stripes. He served as US ambassador to Ukraine for three years until 2009 and has been overseeing the US Embassy in Kiev as chargé d'affaires since Ambassador Marie Yovanovitch was suddenly recalled in May. And finally, Andrei Yermak, the Ukrainian president's chief US negotiator and advisor. He's a media and copyright lawyer by trade, founder of the Garnet Media Group, which produces TV and films in Ukraine. He's also a personal friend of President Zelensky. Now, to this first text, which was before the now infamous July 25 call between Trump and Zelensky, Kurt Volker texts Andre Yermak. Volker says that he's heard from the White House that assuming Zelensky convinces Trump he'll investigate slash get to the bottom of what happened in 2016, we will nail down date for visit to Washington. After the presidential call, the discussion moves to a date for a White House visit. When will it be announced? The Americans want Ukraine to announce an investigation first. And in this text, Yermak, who has now met with Giuliani, explicitly mentions Burisma. You'll recall the natural gas company that employed Hunter Biden. A week later, following further contact with Giuliani, Volker and EU Ambassador Gordon Sondland, Volker suggests what they want the Ukrainians to say in their statement and that they will complete a transparent and unbiased investigation of all available facts and episodes, including those involving Burisma and the 2016 election. Sondland says that's perfect and they'll send it to Yermak. But in late August, the Ukrainians realised the US is not just withholding a formal invitation to the White House, but also withholding hundreds of millions of dollars in military aid. That's where the US's top diplomat in Ukraine, Bill Taylor, comes in. On September 1, he asks, Are we now saying that security assistance and White House meetings are conditioned on investigations? Sondland says, call me. The to and fro continues with more texts and more phone calls. Then, on September 9, this from Bill Taylor. As I said on the phone, I think it's crazy to withhold security assistance for help with a political campaign. And that, as far as many Democrats are concerned, is a smoking gun. Trump using military aid to get Ukraine's help winning the 2020 election, whether that is about the Bidens or potentially just proving that he wasn't actually elected in 2016 as a result of Russian interference. And now comes the strangely formal reply from Gordon Sondland. I believe you are incorrect about President Trump's intentions. The president has been crystal clear, no quid pro quos of any kind. And then 
I suggest we stop the back and forth by text. It shows an awareness on Sondland's part that they need to try and avoid the appearance of a quid pro quo, and also an awareness these texts could become public. Well, they have, and it certainly raises a lot of questions. House Democrats wanted to ask Gordon Sondland a few of those questions, but... We were informed about an hour and a half ago that uh, by the attorney for Ambassador Sondland that the State Department would refuse to allow him to testify today. Even without hearing from Ambassador Sondland, Adam Schiff was pretty confident about what he would have confirmed. We know Ambassador Sondland was a key player in efforts to um, obtain a commitment from Ukraine to investigate a bogus conspiracy theory about the 2016 election, as well as um, Joe Biden and his son. And there are other reasons this guy's important as well. The White House has been holding on to a bunch of text messages that Sondland sent from a private device. And it's always interesting when someone tries to hide relevant communications. Just ask Hillary. Sondland also apparently told Republican Senator Ron Johnson that if Ukraine would move to get to the bottom of what happened in 2016, then Trump would release their military spending. Quid pro quo. Although to be fair, Johnson said that Trump completely denied that he'd ever do that. This does, however, build on a pattern. If we could look at John's Volcker text message from before, you can see that on the morning of the Zelensky phone call, Volcker heard directly from the White House, direct from them, and they wanted a trade of sorts, a quid pro quo. But what they were interested in was not Biden, but the goings on in the 2016 election just like with Sondland and Ron Johnson. And remember in that Zelensky phone call a few weeks back, what was that favor that Trump directly asked for? I wanted to know what happened with this whole situation with Ukraine and crowd strike. He was talking about the 2016 election again, although he did mention Biden later on. Note that his concerns about the 2016 election are part of a legitimate Department of Justice investigation that aren't narrowly about his own self-interest or trying to influence the 2020 election. So it's not nearly as obviously illegal as smearing Joe Biden would be. That could provide the basis for a defense for Trump somewhere down the line, at least from a PR point of view. One more thing I should mention. In Volcker's statement, he maintains that no time was he aware of or took part in an effort to urge Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden. And he also insisted that an advisor to Zelensky asked to be connected with Rudy Giuliani, not the other way round. So that is handy testimony for Trump. We'll see if he needs it. Now, remember, this is what the president was saying just last week. Will you cooperate with those subpoenas? Well, I always cooperate. This is a, a fraudulent crime on the American people, but we'll work together with Shifty Shift and uh, Pelosi and all of them, and we'll see what happens. We will see. And this week, we saw. White House issuing a new declaration of defiance against impeachment investigators. The president's lawyers just sent a letter to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. It spells out the administration's refusal to participate in the Democrats' inquiry, arguing that it's unconstitutional. Yeah, the White House lawyers put three concerns into a rather strange letter, although it does start off pretty much where I left off last week, noting that the rules of this impeachment inquiry currently seem a little bit rigged. So the White House is demanding the right to see all evidence, to present evidence, to call witnesses, to have counsel at all hearings, to cross examine witnesses and so on and so on. Great. I'd love them to make the inquiry fairer. But where they lose me is when they say the House not following the same process as Watergate and Clinton's impeachment shows that the current proceedings are nothing more than an unconstitutional exercise in political theatre. Unconstitutional? Well, this is what the Constitution actually says about this topic. The House of Representatives shall have the sole power of impeachment. And as for the rules, each House may determine the rules of its proceedings. In other words, it's up to the House what their impeachment rules are. What I think should happen or what the President thinks should happen, it's irrelevant. Don't believe me? The Supreme Court ruled about this in 1992. They found the content of impeachment proceedings was wholly in the control of Congress. No court input. 
even for the impeachment trial in the Senate. And it's particularly hard to argue that there are constraints on an impeachment inquiry if even an impeachment trial can do whatever it likes. So right away, Trump's on dubious legal ground. Although that's the height of legitimacy compared to the White House's next point. They say the Zelensky call was appropriate, the president did nothing wrong, and that therefore there is no basis for an impeachment inquiry. Yep. Once again, I think that might be the House's call to make. I don't think the President gets to decide whether there are any grounds for his own impeachment. And lastly, the President's legal team says that the House is just seeking to overturn the results of the 2016 election with impeachment. Well, that is sounding like the President is calling the very idea of impeachment unconstitutional, even though it's right there in the Constitution. Remember what Mueller said. He said that the president couldn't be indicted because the constitution expressly creates an alternative political process for presidential misconduct, impeachment. But now, as this lawyer on Twitter pointed out, Trump's saying that alternative process is too political and illegitimate to use. Meanwhile, Trump's currently in court also arguing that he should have blanket presidential immunity in all stages of federal and state criminal law, including in investigations. So you can't charge him, you can't impeach him, you can't even investigate him. In effect, Trump's lawyers are saying he's like a king, which would seem like a hyperbolic thing for me to say if Trump supporters weren't openly comparing him to a king. Well. Uh, what you're seeing is regicide. This is regicide uh, by another name. Stop helping. Anyway, <laughs> if you find this all a bit hard to follow, let young Lindsey Graham explain how it all works. When asked for information, Richard Nixon chose not to comply, and the Congress back in that time said, you're taking impeachment away from us. You're becoming the judge and jury. It is not your job to tell us what we need. It is your job to comply with the things we need to provide oversight over you. That's how it works. Yeah, that was before they declared the Constitution unconstitutional. <laughs> the White House is blocking anyone still in the administration from answering congressional Democrat subpoenas and giving any evidence or documents to these House committees. Democrats can take that to the courts if they want. But that will take time, and they do want this to be over by Christmas, if possible, so the clock is ticking. But that may not be a bad thing either, because the longer this impeachment inquiry goes, the more support it is getting. This poll will have caused a few furrowed brows in the White House, particularly as it came from the presidentially preferred broadcaster, Fox News. 51% of those responding say the president should be impeached and removed from office. That's up nine points from July. 4% say impeach but do not remove. 40% say do not impeach. So add those up, 55% are now in favour of impeachment. Only 44% say Trump should even stay in office and he was losing to Biden and Warren in that same poll by 10 points. Not good. Yeah, and get this, in that same poll, 66% of people said it was inappropriate for the president to ask a foreign leader to investigate his rival, something that Trump did openly on camera. And only 25% of people think Trump's phone call was perfect. Et tu, Fox. Well, in other big developments this week, Energy Secretary Rick Perry has been subpoenaed to provide documents to House Democrats investigating the Trump Zelensky call. Perry reportedly played a key role in setting up that call. Earlier in the week, Perry denied reports from last week he was preparing to resign next month. That would have provided him with less legal cover to resist these subpoenas. We'll see what happens there. Meanwhile, Two associates of Rudy Giuliani, who worked with him on efforts to discredit the former Vice President Joe Biden in Ukraine, have been indicted. Soviet-born Lev Parnas and Igor Fruman, who were arrested at Dulles International Airport and charged with making illegal foreign contributions to a range of Republican campaigns, including to one of the biggest pro-Trump super PACs, America First. Some donations to influence the removal of the former US ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Yovanovitch, as well. According to the Wall Street Journal, Parnas and Fruman had lunch with Giuliani at Trump International Hotel before their arrest. They were carrying one-way tickets to Frankfurt, Germany. And yeah, that there on the left, that's Lev Parnas with President Trump 
in what caption writers would describe as in happier times. One way ticket, hey? Mm, one way. <laughs> so far, the impeachment inquiry has remained almost entirely partisan. A few Republicans, like Mitt Romney, have expressed concerns about the president's appeal to China and Ukraine to investigate Biden. Romney called that wrong and appalling, which prompted this piece of advice from the president. Mitt, get off the stage. You've already had your turn twice. But it wasn't just Mitt Romney who was outraged at the president's shock decision this week to withdraw US forces from northern Syria, exposing their erstwhile Kurdish allies in the fight against Islamic State, the YPG, to an attack from Turkey. President Trump's golfing buddy and staunch defender Lindsey Graham was apoplectic, using the surest hotline to the president, Fox and Friends. But this impulsive decision by the president has undone all the gains we've made thrown the region into further chaos. It was just like Lindsey Graham was calling from the 1990s. And just in case there was any doubt... They are. Senator. I hope I'm making myself clear how short-sighted and irresponsible this decision is, in my view. And this was how the president defended his decision. We want to bring our soldiers back home. These are the endless wars. And we're not fighting, we're policing to a large extent. We're policing in certain areas. We're not police, we're... These are fighters, great fighters, the greatest in the world. and. That's what they do. So I've told President Erdogan, I hope he's going to uh, treat everybody with great respect. And this was his smackdown of Lindsey Graham. I think Lindsey would like to stay there for the next 200 years and maybe add a couple of hundred thousand people every place. But I disagree with Lindsey on that. The president did threaten economic sanctions against Turkey if they don't operate in as humane a way as possible. Then yesterday, Turkish forces began their invasion of northern Syria following a bombardment of Kurdish towns in the region. Kurdish forces, which control the area, are reporting heavy airstrikes and the start of a ground offensive amid widespread panic. Lindsey Graham isn't the only one who's angry though, John. Many of Trump's supporters are worried about the Kurds because of how much they have helped America out. The Kurds deployed 60,000 troops to fight ISIS compared to America's 2,000, and they sustained 11,000 casualties in the fight compared to America's eight. Unfortunately, this kind of thing just keeps on happening to the Kurds. America has been accused of betraying the Kurds at least eight times in the last century, so you'd think they'd be used to it by now. Even worse, the Kurds were made more vulnerable because they trusted America. American officials signed them up to a security mechanism plan, which removed Kurdish defensive barriers in the hope that that would discourage Turkey from wanting to invade. Bo -bo. And there's yet another problem. The Kurds operate detention sites for all the captured ISIS fighters. There are 11,000 of them, all being guarded by Kurds. Although apparently the Kurds are continuing to guard the ISIS prisoners during the incursion, even preventing a prison break recently. What makes these developments particularly baffling though, is the utter confusion behind the strategy. One day, Trump's using his great and unmatched wisdom to threaten to totally destroy and obliterate the economy of Turkey. The next day, Turkey is an important member in good standing of NATO and is Trump's friend coming around to visit next month. One day, America isn't involved anymore and Turkey, Europe, Syria, Iran, Iraq, Russia and the Kurds will just have to figure the situation out for themselves. The next day, America is involved again, giving financial and military aid. One day, this is about getting out of ridiculous endless wars and bringing our soldiers home. The next day, we find no one's coming home. This was just moving 50 troops to a different part of Syria. I think even Trump's confused about what's going on with the Kurds from the looks of this clip. And as somebody wrote in a very, very powerful article today, they didn't help us in the Second World War. They didn't help us with Nor Normandy, as an example. Uh, one thing that is certain, though, is that Trump still hasn't divested himself of his assets, and he has a conflict of interest with a major, major building in Istanbul. Don't believe me? I have a reliable source. So have I have a little conflict of interest because I have a major, major building in Istanbul. And it's a tremendously successful job. It's called Trump Towers. Two towers instead of one. Not the usual one, it's two. So is Trump allowing the potential slaughter of the Kurds just so he can personally profit? I doubt it. But I don't know. That's the problem when people refuse to remove their conflicts of interest. You just don't know.
Well, for more, we're joined by Jim Carafano, a leading military and foreign policy expert based at the Conservative Heritage Foundation. He worked on the Trump transition team liaising with the State Department and he's with us from our studio in Washington, D.C. Jim Carafano, welcome back to Planet America. Good to be with you. If you were advising President Trump, would you have endorsed a withdrawal from northern Syria and effectively given a green light for a Turkish invasion? Well, I, I think both those statements are actually factually incorrect. U.S. forces haven't withdrawn from Syria. They withdrew out of the way of the advance of Turkish forces, but they're still in the country. And the U.S. didn't greenlight the uh, Turkish incursion. Matter of fact, if you read the statement from the U.S. Department of Defense, it's very clear that that's, that's not the case. The Turk no Turkish government notified the United States that they were going to uh, do an incursion. Matter of fact, the Turks have been saying they've been doing this for a number of years. Wait, Jim, U.S. forces cleared out of the Kurdish-controlled area. Turkish forces then invaded. We've seen it on our TV screens. Okay, so again, I'll be clear. U.S. forces are in Syria. The, they haven't left Syria, if that's the question. And the U.S. did not give Turkey permission to do an incursion into Syria. The Turks didn't even ask for permission from the United States. They just notified the United States they were going to do that. Those are, I believe, factual statements. No, my question was specifically northern Syria, near the border. U.S. forces have pulled back from there, have they not? That is correct, because the Turkish forces are advancing, and it would not make a whole lot of sense to have US, U.S. forces present, particularly if the YPG and the Turks were going to start shooting at each other. That wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. Jim, are you saying that if when Erdogan told Trump he was going to have an incursion in northern Syria, Donald Trump had responded with, well, we're not going to let you, then Erdogan would have done it anyway? Well, first of all, I, 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 I don't know how I would prove a counterfactual of what the president would say and what the Turks would say. Um, the, the, did you have, have the capacity to stop the Turks from doing an incursion? The answer is no. That's never been the case. We've never had enough U.S. forces there to actually prevent the Turks from taking military action. So unless the United States wanted to either arm the YPG and tell them to ha go ahead and fight through Turkish forces, or the United States wanted to start bombing Turkish forces, the U.S. doesn't really have the capacity or capability to prevent Turkey from doing an incursion. I think that that's factually true. It looks like after arming and using the Kurds in the fight against Islamic State, the U.S. has walked away from an ally. What do you say to that? Well, first of all, the YPG is not an ally of the United States any more than the Mujahideen was an ally of the United States in the Afghan conflict. The United States has supported and provided resources and work with the YPG because we've been working together to combat ISIS. Um, as far as I know, that is still U.S. policy. The YPG and the SDF um, still occupy territory in Syria uh, where there's a Kurdish population because the Turks have not taken over all the Kurdish area in Syria. The U.S. forces are still there. Indeed, the, the YPG, the bulk of the ISIS detainees that the YPG holds are not in the area of the Turkish incursion, as, as, as much as I've been told and I understand. They're actually in areas that are still controlled by the YPG. And as far as I know, the YPG doesn't have any intention of releasing them. So do you think there's any broader strategy at play here? Or is Trump simply responding to the situation and removing troops for pragmatic reasons? Well, I, I, I do think the movement of the U.S. troops was just clearly pragmatic. If you, I think if you actually look at U.S. policy in Syria, d despite all the hubbub and, and the concern and everything, I think there's a question of whether the Turkish incursion would actually impinge on our vital interests. Will it make it easier for Iran to attack Israel? I don't think so. Um, does it really materially change the fight against ISIS? Despite all the rhetoric, I'm not really sure it does. There's not many, the, the, there are only a few thousand ISIS detainees in the area, as far as I understand, that Turkey is taking over. And Turkey's already said that it intends to continue to de detain those individuals. Um, and uh, the Turks have stated that uh, their goal is uh, not to precipitate uh, a, a massive refugee, refugee crisis. Um, and indeed, I think the, the U.S. and the entire international community has been, been pretty clear of that, that if the, on these Turkish operations, they still have a responsibility to provide humanitarian aid. They have a responsibility to protect innocent lives. Um, they have a responsibility to detain ISIS fighters. They can't let the uh, area be a platform for, uh, for terrorists. Uh, so they don't fundamentally change U.S. policy. They really don't fundamentally change conditions on the ground in Syria. And, you know, Syria is a big problem before this happened. And 
you know, quite honestly, it's going to be a big problem after this happens, regardless of the outcome of the operation. Right up until the day this incursion was announced, America was working with the Kurds to remove their defenses to keep Turkey happy. Right. In hindsight, was that a mistake? Well, it wouldn't have made a difference. I mean, those defenses would have been speed bumps. If the Turks really wanted to do the incursion, which they did, those defenses would not have stopped them. Indeed, if they tried to hold those defenses, probably more people would have gotten killed. So I'm not sure. Obviously, it didn't placate the, the, the Turks, but would it have stopped the Turks and deterred them? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure it would have. Erdogan has told Europe, if you call this an invasion, we'll send millions of refugees onto your doorstep. Is that appropriate behaviour from a NATO ally? Well, at least Erdogan's consistent. He often says things which are incredibly unhelpful, uh, disingenuous or, or, uh, or, uh, or, or really wrong. This isn't about, is Erdogan a good guy and is he doing a good foreign policy? I can conclusively tell you he is not. I mean, it's a NATO ally, but he's made some really bad decisions, many of them actually hurtful to Turkey's own security. So this isn't about a defense of Erdogan or saying what they're doing is the right thing. This is really about what's going to happen on the ground in Syria. How is it really going to impinge on U.S. interests? How is it going to impinge on the stability of the region? Um, it's not a, this isn't a, a notion, this isn't a, 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 you know, an argument about is Erdogan a good leader or a bad leader? He's a horrible, terrible foreign policy leader. Jim, you said Turkey has promised to look after the ISIS prisoners. There's apparently 11,000 of those prisoners. Why not leave a few troops around just to make sure they're looked after? As far as I understand, and you know, from the data that I've looked at and what I've been told, the bulk of those detainees are not in the areas that Turkey is moving into. They are in other areas. And as far as I know, the YPG is still planning on detaining them with the cooperation and support of the United States. And if you think about it, it wouldn't make a lot of sense for the YPG to let those guys go because, they, because they're the enemies of the YPG and they would just turn around and try to kill them. So I'm not really sure this, this, about this mass release of ISIS detainees is as significant as, as a lot of the concerns are expressed. And you know, for the Turkish government, we do know there are some detention facilities that are in areas that are going to be occupied by Turkey. Turkey has claimed that they're going to take responsibility for those areas and they're going to continue to detain those people. And I think this is, you know, we make a lot of this about Donald Trump. This is really about Turkey. Turkey has done something which is very, very risky. They've made a bunch of promises that they're going to do this right. I think what we really ought to focus on is look at Tur Turkish actions and, and hold them accountable for what they say they're going to do. Jim, it takes a lot to unite Republicans and Democrats in Washington these days, yet there was bipartisan condemnation of this move by President Trump. What did you make of that? So the way the president rolled it out, it certainly created a, a political firestorm and he's had lots of criticisms for all sides, why people are making those criticisms and what they intend for them. They, they would have to speak for themselves. I, I don't deal in, 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 in the politics of this. I deal in the policy. And the way I look at it is, what are U.S. interests? We don't want another caliphate. We don't want a massive humanitarian crisis that would be bad for the destabilize the region of Europe. We don't want Iran to have a super highway to attack Israel. The Turkish incursion, if it's done as the Turks promise, um, it, would, it won't interfere with those goals. So um, right now, I'm in a wait and see attitude. Uh, and I don't think the US is really doing anything really different in Syria than we were doing before this announcement. The real question is, is what will the Turks do in their incursion? Will they do it correctly? And will they, in the end, contribute to the stability of the region or will they make it worse? We'll have to see what they actually do. Jim Carafano, thank you very much indeed for your time. Hey, thanks for having me. Thank you. The big news in the 2020 presidential race this week was that Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren has continued her rise to the top of national polls, briefly overtaking Joe Biden in the average for the first time. In the real clear politics average, Warren had the barest of leads, 26.6 to 26.4 midweek, with Bernie Sanders 12 points back on 14.6 then. Buttigieg, Harris, Yang, O'Rourke, Booker, Klobuchar, Castro and the rest of them below 1%. Then the Fox News poll came out and gave Biden a 10-point buffer. So as of Friday, the former Veep is back in front by almost two points. 
Warren does still have some weaknesses. In particular, if you look at the last Quinnipiac poll, Warren might be beating Biden 29 to 26 overall, beating Biden amongst men 27 to 24, almost tying with Biden amongst white working class voters 25 to 27. But she's still behind Biden amongst black voters 20 to 36. There's a weakness. Mm. Having said that, you're right. She's doing well enough to take some incoming fire from both the far left and the right at the moment. And I think if she wins a nomination, I think I know what we're going to see a lot more of. Come this way. Big, beautiful world. Now, I don't know how many Elizabeth Warren speeches you watch, but if the answer is more than zero, you've probably seen her tell the tale of when she was sacked as a teacher back in 1971. I was visibly pregnant. And the principal did what principals did in those days, wished me luck and hired someone else for the job. Okay, I so was visibly pregnant. Wished me luck and hired someone else for the job. Yes, I was visibly pregnant. Wished me luck and hired someone else for the job. All right, so she says it a lot. But over at socialist magazine Jacobin, they were unimpressed. You see, they're big Bernie Sanders fans over there. Apparently this is what they were doing to each other when they heard Bernie Sanders might need a new heart. I would not be surprised. But one of their writers noticed that Elizabeth Warren was telling a different story back in 2007. Then that summer, uh, I, I actually didn't have the education courses, so I was on an emergency certificate, it was called. And I went back to graduate school and took a couple of courses in education and said, I don't think this is gonna work out for me. Mm. And I was pregnant with my first baby. So I had a baby uh, and stayed home for a couple of years. Well, that sounds a little bit different, doesn't it? And it fits straight into a pre-prepared narrative that is ready to go. Well, for decades, Elizabeth Warren pretended to be an American Indian in order to game our affirmative action system, kind of a stolen valor situation. But it turns out it might be something of a trend. Just wait till Tucker finds out that in 2012, Warren also said she was the first nursing mother to take a bar exam in the state of New Jersey, and she couldn't support the claim. It would just be too much for the poor guy. But did Warren actually lie? Warren told CBS that after becoming a public figure, she opened up more about different pieces in her life and this was one of them. So in other words, it was her 2007 story that was the white lie. Maybe so. But CBS dug up a news report from 1971 that said Warren had resigned for personal reasons. Not a big deal, except the board had voted to appoint Warren, reappoint her, to the same job. So does that mean that she wasn't fired then? Well, look at this. The conservative Washington Free Beacon dug up the minutes of the 1971 Riverdale Board of Education meetings, fascinating I'm sure, and in April 21, they did indeed approve the reissuing of a contract to Elizabeth Warren. And then in June, they accepted her resignation with regret, which matches her 2007 story, but not her 2019 story. Oh dear. Except Warren also said that her contract was renewed in April 1971 because she'd been hiding her pregnancy from the school. You see, she was four months pregnant at the time. And then a couple of months later, when she was six months pregnant, the principal then noticed that's when he called her in, wished her luck and said he was gonna hire someone else for the job. So that does all match the timeline. Furthermore, a teacher from the same school in the 70s said that while she didn't remember any explicit sackings for getting pregnant, the rule was, at five months, you had to leave when you were pregnant. If you didn't tell anybody, you could try to stay on a little bit longer, but they kind of wanted you out if you were pregnant. So her 2019 story is at least consistent with all that evidence. But you judge for yourself. Look deep into those eyes, and no, not that deep, and ask yourself, 
Why are we going to spend the next 12 months arguing about this minor, minor detail? Because you know we will, don't you? Oh yes, we absolutely will. Bloody elections! Ugh. Big, beautiful world. Well, whether she's lying or not, you know the Trump tweets and ads are going to be coming, which is why money is such an issue. And Elizabeth Warren's doing well at the moment, just behind Bernie Sanders. Interestingly, they're both focusing on small donors, no big money fundraisers for either of them. And here's the advantage of that strategy. In the second quarter, barely any of Sanders or Warren donors had given the $2,800 they're allowed to donate. But since Biden was going for the big donors, 38% of Biden's donations came from people who couldn't give any more money, which is part of the reason he didn't raise so much money in the third quarter. And now he's struggling just when he needs to spend a heap of money on early state advertising, which is yet another reason that Biden might be in trouble. Mm. And Warren seems impressed enough with small donors that she's extended her promise to not hold any big money fundraisers to cover the general election as well, which would seem like a big deal coming up against Trump and his massive war chest, except it's not as big a deal as it seems because she's still happy to do fundraisers for the Democratic National Committee. And rather than donating a $2,800 maximum for Elizabeth Warren, each person can legally donate $355,000 per person for the DNC. So that's actually where the real big money mm. is. One step at a time, John. Yeah, right to the bank. Elizabeth Warren has jumped to an eight-point lead over President Trump in a poll from Quinnipiac. The same poll put Joe Biden 11 points clear of the president and Bernie Sanders seven points ahead. But the troll poll of the week must be this from Rasmussen. They posed a hypothetical head-to-head -head between President Trump and his 2016 rival Hillary Clinton. It was 45 apiece. That poll prompted this tweet. I think crooked Hillary Clinton should enter the race and try to steal it away from uber-left Elizabeth Warren. While the very thought of a rematch of that particular train wreck of an election is enough to elicit groans from all sides, it's hardly a good result for Trump either, given Rasmussen has a tendency to overstate his poll numbers by about 5%. And, of course, Hillary is not running. Or is she? Certainly Hillary is happy to do a little bit of trolling of her own. Well, maybe there does need to be a rematch. I mean, obviously, I can beat him again. No, no, no. Of course, no. part of the reason for Elizabeth Warren's role apart from her performance in the debates and on the campaign trail, has been a dip in support for Bernie Sanders. Biden's pretty steady, but Bernie has been going down, particularly since his health scare last week. Bernie has lost three points since he had what his campaign at first described as some chest discomfort, but which his doctors later called a myocardial infarction and what everybody else would call a heart attack. The Sanders campaign has faced criticism for being slow to reveal the truth. Still, Senator Sanders was up and about and out of hospital this week, and he had this message for his supporters. I just want to thank all of you for the love and warm wishes uh, that you sent to me. Uh, see you soon on the campaign trail. Donald Trump is the fourth American president to face an impeachment hearing. We've heard a lot about Nixon and Clinton, the two most recent examples of the Congress deciding whether to remove a sitting president, but much less about the first, which, given the current president's general attitude towards Congress, may in fact be more instructive. This is the story of the impeachment of President Andrew Johnson. A former Tennessee congressman, governor and senator, Andrew Johnson was elected vice president in November 1864 on a ticket with President Abraham Lincoln. It was an unusual political pairing given Lincoln was a Northern Republican and Johnson a Southern Democrat, but these were extraordinary times. With the Civil War still being fought, the ultimate victory of the Unionists was in sight and Lincoln wanted Johnson's help to bring the South back into the fold. Lincoln and Johnson ran under the banner of the National Union Party, and they won, though Andrew Johnson's vice presidency got off to an inauspicious start. The night before the inauguration, Johnson was thrown a party and he drank way too much. The next morning, he was given more whiskey to steady his nerves by outgoing vice president Hannibal Hamlin. After his swearing in, Johnson delivered a meandering, at times incoherent speech to the alarm of onlookers, including Lincoln. 
the next few weeks, Andrew Johnson was in disgrace. Lincoln reassured colleagues, saying, I have known Andy Johnson for many years. He made a bad slip the other day, but you need not be scared. Andy ain't a drunkard. Meanwhile, Lincoln delivered one of the greatest pieces of oratory in political history, his second inaugural address. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and for his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and all nations. Just over a month later, the Confederate capital of Richmond, Virginia, fell to Union forces under General Ulysses S. Grant, and peace was almost at hand. Then, on the night of April 14th, President Lincoln was shot during a performance at Washington's Ford Theater. He died of his wounds the following morning, making Andrew Johnson America's 17th president. Johnson had opposed the secession of the Confederate States, but he still held some very Southern views on race, declaring, This is a country for white men, and as long as I am president, it shall be a government for white men. The Congress that Johnson inherited was overwhelmingly Republican. The biggest issue facing them was the reconstruction of the Union, readmitting the breakaway states and making the profound social and economic adjustments brought about by the end of slavery. The slaves were free, but were they to be full citizens? Could they vote? What civil rights would be afforded to them? Republicans in Congress wanted to go a lot further than a lot of southern states and Democrats, including Johnson. The president clashed repeatedly with Congress, blocking several Reconstruction Acts and laws that prevented southern rebels from regaining control of state governments and others that gave freed slaves the right to vote. Presidential vetoes and congressional overrides flew thick and fast. Congress passed the Tenure of Office Act in 1867, preventing a president from sacking government officials without the approval of the Senate. Johnson again defied Congress by sacking Secretary of War Edwin Stanton and replacing him with General Grant. Congress then reinstated Stanton. Grant resigned. Johnson dismissed Stanton, who then locked himself in his office and refused to budge. And that is when Congress decided to impeach President Andrew Johnson. On February 24, 1868, the House voted by 126 to 47 in favour of impeachment for disgrace, ridicule, hatred, contempt and reproach the Congress of the United States. The Senate then embarked on an 11-week trial. Johnson, fearing the worst, backed down on the Reconstruction Acts and promised to stop attacking the Congress. On May 16th, Johnson avoided conviction by the required two-thirds majority of the Senate by a single vote. He survived, but not for long. The Republican Party nominated Ulysses S. Grant for the presidency. Johnson failed to win the Democratic presidential nomination and General Grant won that November's election. Proof that surviving impeachment does not guarantee survival in politics. And once again, Chaz, we are right out of time. No extra, unfortunately, this week, but we do have an extra long Jim Carafano interview, so go and have a look at it. It's a good one. Bye-bye.